Martin Duffy, welcome to the Wolf Brothers podcast. We're delighted to have you on. Um, I suppose I first came across you when, when was it? I think last summer I was, I remember I was down in Mayo and it down with my girlfriend who lives down there and I just felt really off with myself and I remember going out to the to the beach I just needed a bit of time to myself and I went down to the beach and just sat out and looked at the water and I was kind of wondering like what was wrong with me because my life was like on paper it looked perfect like I was with my girlfriend who was the love of my life and everything was working out well career-wise and great friends but I just felt there was something missing and I remember just looking out at the water and just being like, what is like, what is wrong with me? Like, why do I not feel like content? And then I was driving home the next day. And I remember someone had put into the group a podcast that Pat Dively did with you. And I just started listening to it. And as I was listening to it, I think it was near the end of the podcast, you mentioned soul retrieval. And as soon as you said it, it was just like something clicked in my mind. I was like, I think that's I think that's something I need to do. Um and then I think I contacted the um your page when I got home and then I think it was the Thursday then of that week I ended up sitting in front of you and chatting with you and everything started to make sense with that. So um I suppose that was a year ago now and we've done um one of your courses there recently and I did the past life regression course as well last year. So maybe I just kinda of wanted to start with that, maybe that soul retrieval piece. And I know it's something that you do a lot of with people at the minute. So do you, do you think in society at the moment, there's like a, a loss maybe in, in that soul piece and why, why is that so prominent now in your work? Yeah, you're right. I mean, there's an endemic soul loss in our society and most of us suffer from some degree of soul loss. I mean, soul loss, and so retrieval, it's a survival strategy. When we're under stress or that we've had undergo trauma, part of the psyche of the soul from a shamanic perspective splits off and goes into a safe zone or into another place where it preserves that aspect of itself, the joy, the connection, you know, because if we were to remain fully present to the trauma while it was going on, well, our psyche could fragment and we could end up in a situation where we're in a spiritual emergency. So the part of the psyche that goes away often goes into what we call the other world, connects with um, the spirit beings and the allies there and, and kind of sort of hides out there or, you know, waits there for a, an appropriate time to come back again. Sometimes it doesn't come back of its own and people will suffer from symptoms of um, addiction, um, loneliness, depression, feeling something's missing in their life, um, a sense of emptiness that they try and fill from the outside in, which doesn't work. And in that case, the shamanic practitioner will take a journey um, for the client into the other world with their allies and paranormals and track down the soul part of the part of the psyche and then retrieve it energetically and blow it, blow it back into the crown chakra and the heart chakra, reuniting the person with those aspects of themselves that have gone missing. And therefore, you know, people often feel more alive, more connected, more earthy, more grounded. I have to do that work. And as I, as I say, it's 80% of the work I do at the moment because it's endemic, you know, right across our society at, at the minute. Mm. You know, yeah. so on that day, just one quick thing is mm. I, I, I also, Martin, um, I think Cormac sent me on the podcast or I got it in the same group actually. Yeah. And I ended up going and doing a soul retrieval with you as well. Yeah. Um, and for me, what I've just realized, and this is only in the last week, that was about a year ago now, too. And all the pieces are not all, but the majority of the pieces have only just come together. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it wasn't an instant thing for me. It was, I met two particular guides on that journey I did with you, the wolf yeah. and the eagle. Mm -hmm. And in a holotropic breathwork session about two months ago, they came in mm -hmm. and actually gave me a release mm -hmm. that I actually nearly killed myself trying to get over the last 10 years numerous times and the, the eagle and the wolf i hadn't i wasn't even they weren't conscious in my mind but they came in and they brought me yeah brought me and led to this release of energy that i'd been holding in for probably most of my life really it was yeah. this it was this anger that would always come up that i could never feel like i could never control and then in a ceremony about two weeks ago i realized why 
or I have a, I'm fairly sure of why now, because of a memory that was unlocked, why that part of my soul detached. Because when we were in the journey with you, when I was in the journey with you, you you told me that you seen my, I think it was like my five-year-old self in a pond. Yeah. Okay. And I always felt like I was drowning as well, which is very interesting. And I am a memory that my um, psyche somehow completely shut off from me was only revealed to me two weeks ago. So it's like after coming full circle, but I think another thing, what I, my point was just it sometimes obviously isn't an instant thing. That was like a year long process where because of that journey, different things just kept getting unlocked. And it was, and at times it's, it, it's quite um, overwhelming kind of trying to sit in that and because you're never sure when it's going to come or, you know, just, I suppose, yeah, it's just to be, for people that might be thinking of it, it, it might just not be an instant thing. No, well, you make a good point there. I mean, a lot of this work is very much about the integration. And so it's the soul retrieval can act as a, like a seed that's planted within the psyche. And your inner self or your soul self knows how to do the work at, at a deep level. So um, um, a soul retrieval can be overwhelming for somebody who say had a, a traumatic experience because the memories that got suppressed can start to return. The numb feelings that have been put aside can start to surface again because the psyche starts kicking back into action it wants to heal itself through that um, journey of the archetypal Chiron wounded healer kind of dimension of things. And healing is actually uh, a powerful experience that we go through. It's not something that's always pleasant, but it's always necessary. As I say to my students, suffering is the growing pains of the soul in the sense that we tend to our woundedness in an alchemical way. And then we grow out of that experience as it raises us to higher vibrational frequency. So a soul retrieval will often kickstart a process. And you put it very well there. You said when you were in a holotropic breathwork session, another very powerful way of working with um, Stan Groff's way of working with holotropic um, breathwork. And we do a version of that here in Dunderry with shamanic breathwork. But as you said, it was amazing that the power animals came in for you at the, at the time when you were ready for the integration and brought you into that place. So you're right. It may not be an instantaneous thing, but it's, it's a work in progress. And I often find that people come back to me, you know, after soul retrieval for follow-up work a few, about three, four, five, six months later. And that's when often um, we, we, we bring in the next phase or the next stage when the integration really takes place then. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I suppose it's um, the, like you spend so, well, for me anyway, I spent so long creating all those conditions for myself it's it's never gonna it's got obviously gonna take quite a while to to unlearn and undo them as well it's i think it's just the way we are these days we want everything instantly and it's just not like that and it'd be and it would probably be far too overwhelming yeah. for us to to handle if it was an instant thing i think i'm really starting to learn how what's uncovered happens when you're ready to handle it mm. Mm. absolutely yeah. Yeah. Um, you're you're right i mean that's why i like jung's model of psychology too because he talks about the slow integration and um, working with the psyche and the unconscious and paying particular attention to your dreams, your fantasies or your journeys. Um, and you find over time, if you keep a journal, that the psyche heals itself um, in a way that is not going to be overwhelming. And, and that's important. We see nowadays that a lot of people seem to be wanting to storm heaven. They're rushing around wanting instant fixes and insecure. This is our social media kind of times we live in. And one of the concerns I have is that a lot of people are running to um, these psychedelic circles that, you know, aren't often held properly in terms of integration or whatever. And they haven't even ever done a shamanic journey or a breathwork session or worked on their dreams. Even some of them haven't even ever smoked cannabis. And they're dropping themselves into these Cambo circles or ayahuasca circles, whatever. And they're not ready for the experience and it blows them apart. And I'm, a lot of my work recently is kind of integrating and helping people ground themselves again after these experiences. Now, I'm a fan of psychedelics in, 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 as such in the sense that when I trained with Stan Groff, his work came out of LSD 25. I've worked with the shamans in the Amazon and in Mexico and in Mongolia and in different ways with plant medicines. But, you know, I do sound a note of caution in terms of set, the, the, the setting where you do it, the, 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 the type of um, medicine you're working with, but particularly 
follow up on integration and integration afterwards. But because the psyche is wise, the psyche knows how to do this work in integration. So, and that's why I say the slow meandering way is the most important thing to do in terms of integration, dream work, journal work, that kind of thing. And then it, like, as, as, as the care of shaman say in the end is, it's not much good if it doesn't grow corn. How does it affect your everyday life in regards to you living a better life for yourself and those around you? Mm-hmm. I think that's a great point because you can get caught up in all the the methods and things like that. And I don't know, nearly be, there's, there's almost ego attached to like how many times you've done ayahuasca or whatever. And I've even noticed it in myself sometimes being like, when you're talking about it, you feel like there's a sense of like achievement or something because you've maybe faced a certain demons, which yeah. is true in a sense, but it's like when you start attaching yourself to the process rather than the results, like why are you doing this? Like it's to become a better person. And actually recently enough as well, I thought I was going to go back and do another ayahuasca ceremony because I was like, oh, I'm getting signs, but I was probably creating the signs myself. I was actually looking at a documentary on ayahuasca and thinking, oh, I think that's a sign I need to go. Yeah. I was like, <laughs> anyway, I had the realization then I was like, do you really need to go or do you actually just need to do the work every day to work on this thing? That So I kind of had the realization, I was like, maybe I need to just focus on my meditation practice and stick to that every morning and don't be making excuses like, I don't have time this morning, like do the, the half an hour in the morning and just sit with this thing and let it unfold and watch yourself every day, like your habits, your triggers. And as soon as I made that decision to do that instead, I've realized that that was definitely the way I was meant to go this time. Because I think as you mentioned in the cosmic game, that course we were doing, like you were shown the top of the mountain and then they told you to go back down and earn the right to walk back up there. So like, I think that's kind of the philosophy I have at the moment. It's like, I've seen, Yes, I think it's important to maybe see the top of the mountain so you know what's up there and like you see the connectedness of everything. And but then the journey is to like learn how to walk back up with your own with your own feet, I suppose. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, the plant medicine psychedelics will bring you to the top of the mountain and they'll show you the promised land and you're there, you experience it and it's real. And you have no question or doubt that this is a real and true experience when, and you're in that very powerful archetypal realm. Um, but you do have to come back down then and integrate that experience into your everyday lives. And unfortunately, some people like Icarus in Greek mythology, where he flew too close to the sun and the, the wax melted and he, and he crashed to the ground. And I think that's the problem with when you get to the top of the mountain, you feel some people feel they have to keep taking more and more medicines, more and more uh, psychedelics to stay there because they don't want to come back down. And you cannot maintain that level of vibration and frequency over your lifetime unless you build the groundwork in your everyday life to hold and contain those experiences. Um, you're going to be in trouble. I mean, and, and some people are getting in trouble. It's like you, you, you open your psyche to those deep realms. You're not doing the integration work. And then you start losing touch with everyday reality. You're neglecting, you know, Maslow's um, needs, you know, the security, shelter, looking after your physical body, your mental body, your, your, your psychological well-being. And then you're just chasing the dragon then. You're chasing this experience. And eventually what happens to a lot of people, their psyche burns out or they trigger themselves into a spiritual emergency and it takes time to get back. So what we're saying is the medicines are good if used sparingly and integration is work done, is done between sessions. And I also say, you know, become au fait with say, taking a drum journey um, in a shamanic journey way sense or become familiar with, with breath work where you can do holotropic or shamanic breath work, um, which is equally as powerful in ways, maybe not as intense, but it'll get you to the same place. Or you do other experiential forms of work that can bring you back up that mountain. You're not relying on, you know, the very intense, powerful psychedelic experience every time. And if you learn to walk it up, say, using what I call, you know, methods like drumming, breathing, trance dancing, that kind of thing, then you have access to that experience all the time and you're, you're not having to travel on a journey that's eight to 12 hours. It takes days or weeks to, to come back down and in, integrate again. You have access to it on a, access to it on a, on a, on a daily basis, then stalking awareness in nature or whatever. 
And that's often much more healing and powerful in, in, in the long run. The, the psychedelics bring you there, they open up the space, but then you can have access to those spaces by finding other means and methods of reaching them. Mm. Exactly. Yeah, definitely. It's like that the weekend we just had there with Ronan O'Brien from Brettway of Ireland. Yeah. That was just community, actually, three hours of drumming, Brett work. Yeah. And it's probably, and it's just for the one day, and it's probably the most, yeah, like after the different types of things I've been doing in the past, this is probably the, the, the most alive I've been feeling after. And it was just a short, you know, community based. Mm -hmm. Everyone breathing together, drumming together, and you just feel absolutely fantastic after it. Just so alive and full. Like your cup just feels very full, overflowing. Yeah. Really. yeah. I hear you. And, and I mean, you're right about community and, and people like minded, like hearted people come together to hold each other in those spaces. And that's what I love about the holotropic breathwork model. You know, the person's, one person's breathing, one, they have, a, have a, a sitter who exchanges with them in the afternoon, one person's breathing, one person sitting. And then, we, we would have five or six facilitators on the floor um, over a three to four hour session. And we would do um, body work with them. You know, if there's something coming through birth trauma or past life trauma or childhood issues, we will actually get them to exaggerate the symptoms and put a sound on it and do um, focused body work with them. So they get them to cathart and express what's going on. And then, you know, it can, it, it can look like mayhem in there for a while, but you come out of the session and, that evening, say the Saturday evening, you're in the group and it's like there's a stillness about the place. Mm -hmm. And what I'm really most impressed about is how complete strangers who've never met before come together in that space. And next thing they're holding each other, they're, they're, they're supporting each other, they're doing work with each other. And, and, and the, the, the Saturday night, and uh, we do trance dancing and on Sunday morning, we do integration groups. There's a, there's a stillness and a beauty and a real sense of connection and community there. Mm -hmm. And we, we can't underestimate how, that, how important that is. Mm, yeah, definitely. I, I really feel that as well after the week or the, the day yesterday with Red Wave. Um, so I think it was like I said to Daryl on the way home there, I was like, how many hugs I gave out there in the last day, I don't even know. So like just that itself and just a lot of the people I never knew before, but we we're all in that space together. And that's part of the healing, I suppose, is coming together with people who you don't know. And you just you're all from different backgrounds and different ways of thinking. And I actually said to Daryl, it was like, it's one place where I feel I can actually just fully be myself because no, I just know nobody there is going to judge me because I'm, we're all so different and I just like no one, you just don't really feel anyone cares. So um, I think that's a imp really important part of it. Um, I was actually thinking of just maybe going back a bit, Martin, and maybe asking you a bit about like your backstory and like how you got into this type of work, I suppose it might be just interesting for people to hear um, what brought you into it initially. Yeah, well, I trained as a psychiatric nurse we're back in 1977 in Monaghan in St. Davenant's Hospital and very quickly into that I thought I was going to a different kind of profession altogether because I imagine we do counselling and therapy and, and psychology but I found then it was based very much on the biomedical model just by treating people with drugs, ECT, all that kind of thing and I became disillusioned with that system very quickly and then trained as a counsellor um, um, and then went on to train in, 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 as a Jungian psychotherapist and it was through my training in those fields I discovered the work of Stan Groff, read his first book that, you know, that I came across was The Realms of the Human Unconscious, and then got into holotropic breathwork. Part of the, uh, the, the school that I trained in was actually doing primal and breathwork back in those days. So I had these very deep and powerful experiences, um, which were shamanic in nature a lot of times, or transpersonal. And then I had no reference points for them until I discovered the shamanism and, and, and Stan Groff's work. So... I was fortunate enough then to train with Stan Groff. Um, I think I started training with him in Fintorn in Scotland in the late 80s, um, 88, 89, 90. And then set up um, a transverse psychotherapy group at that time. And we ran holotropic breathworks sessions out there in Dowdstown House outside Navan until we had the, our own centre at Dunderry Park. And then through the breathwork, I, I had a deep and profound experience that I now realise was a shamanic experience and it was only when I was in London in 1990, the Professor of Mind, Body, Spirit, a book literally fell off the shelf. I knocked it over and it tipped out and it was called The Way of the Shaman by Michael Harner. And it came with a cassette tape of the drumming that I still use. Mm. So when I came home, stuck on the drumming, followed the instruction, 
bingo. I was in, never looked back. The first shamanic journey I ever did, I connected with power animals, went down into the lower world. And I felt like I had come home, that this where, was, was where I, I was meant to be. It just spoke to me. I, like I grew up, my grandfather, you see, was a folk healer. And my mother, she's 90 now this year, she still is. So I grew up with this idea of, of alternative healing, of holistic healing, the fairies, the banshees. That was part of my, my everyday experience with my grandparents and, and, and the folk then. So I suppose over the years then, I've tried to pull all this together and integrate it into my own way of working from the background in psychiatry to training in regular counseling and psychotherapy, moving into shamanism, and then that brought me all over the world to work with indigenous peoples. So, you know, I'm constantly learning. I'm constantly looking for new ways of doing, doing the work out at um, Dunderry Park in the, in the Irish Centre of Shamanic and Transpersonal Studies there. And the pandemic shut me down the last two years, but I still opened up outside in the tent people out in nature they loved it I'm doing the same this year and then looking more towards starting up breath work and indoor shamanic training over the winter and, and into the new year so that's a kind of a, a synopsis of, of what got me into it and, and and what motivates me to keep going at this work because I love it because I've seen mm. how effective it is and in comparison to just throwing people drugs or medication and you know sending them home you know in in, in desperate states mm. and yeah maybe can you just speak a bit more to the medical side of things? Like I think you said to me, it's it's more of like suppression of you know emotions, and yeah. um, there was no actual will to actually really help people. Or like, what did you see when you were in there? Well, I worked for thirty five years as a community psychiatric nurse, and then what I saw was um, psychiatry and psychology and mainstream biomedical model is about suppression. The other work we do, the breath work, the shamanic work, is about expression because it's about catharsis and releasing those pent up, deep, frustrated um, coex energy um, complexes within the unconscious that are causing the person to um, have symptoms of anxiety, depression, or relationship problems or stress in their lives. But also more importantly, as Jung said, in the psychological rule is that which we hold within ourselves, within our unconscious, we meet in life as fate. That there seems to be this system within us, the graph calls the coex system, that if we're holding particular trauma or charge or unconscious complex in our um, inner psyche, um, Ivor Brown called it the frozen past. It's very interesting that it seems to attract people, situations and experiences to us in our everyday lives that resonate with that complex. So when we cathart the complex, we move it through our experiences and we let it go through different means that we've been talking about. Not only do the symptoms clear, we have more psychic energy than for life, but also we stop manifesting people's situations and experiences that are attracted to us in the middle world because we no longer need them to prod and poke us into becoming more conscious because we have awoken to that level of consciousness and our actually everyday reality then shifts and changes because as we've done the inner work, the outer work, the outer world changes towards us. It's a fascinating process. So the biomedical model is completely different from that. It sees people as pathological, sick, signs and symptoms, um, illnesses and it's about suppression of the symptoms medicating people into submission so that they'll be good little citizens and they can be managed and there's no I'll be honest with you I mean I'm there 35 years there's no real care or compassion for the suffering of what people call mental illness or mental ill health and um, it's all about managing it and you know as well as I do when you hold space for people who are suffering no matter what it is, so we, we can diagnose a schizophrenia or bipolar or depression or anxiety or whatever. What I've always been interested in is what is the person feeling? What are they experiencing? It's not your, your, your psychotic, and so, so just your label as a generally. So what do you experience? Because often what I found was that these people were moving through in spiritual emergence, which sometimes became an emergency for them, a spiritual emergency, because it was overwhelming and too much for them, and they were misunderstood, um, misdiagnosed, and mistreated. But once you explain things to them, and I've recommended that book, Stormy Search for the Self by Stan Groff, to hundreds of people. And once they read in, in, in this book and they say, that makes sense. I understand I'm not going mad. I'm, I'm having these experiences, but now I realize it's Kundalini energy rising through me, or it's I'm having these very powerful encounters with other beings and other realities, other dimensions that are shamanic allies I teach you or that my, my ancestors come to me, that's okay, that's normal, people know about these things. 
once you you know you normalize those experiences with people that's often half the battle people often begin to get well just knowing that this is normal for a lot of people and that's what we find in Dundee Park people come in on a Friday evening into do workshops or you know courses with us it's 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 knowing that there are other people there who are like them is a big part of the healing process for them because they don't feel so alone anymore yeah that that really resonates with me the just having the awareness because I remember the last time <clears throat> last time I went into treatment for addiction um, when I was going in like the reason it was it worked that time was because I wanted I wanted to change for myself I wasn't doing it for anyone else this time but I still I was very going in there very overwhelmed with how long it might actually be before I feel good because I had such um, I felt I had such a mountain of shit from all the stuff that happened through them years and when I went in and spoke, I just somebody told me to just speak when I'm speaking to the therapist, because obviously deep down, you know, the things you need to express. It's just we're in kind of in the way, you know. Um, so I just spoke. And when I was walking back to the room, it just felt like a weight was lifted because I was just in the process then. You know, I was I was aware then that I didn't need to solve everything straight away. Do you know, it's like it's just being in the process and being aware that it's there is like so much of the pressure just falls, you know? And so that really resonated with me when you said that. And what, what I was also kind of wondering, cause people ask me this sometimes, and sometimes I'm not sure how to answer it. And that is if someone wants to start this healing journey for themselves, start reconnecting with themselves, what advice would you give as first steps? Well, I think first steps is, to educate yourself in terms of, uh, you know, do, do, do some research into, you know, what's going on for you, how you're feeling. And then, you know, because that's a good start to, to know that others have been down the road before you and they, they've written about it or, or they've shared their experiences and you're not alone in, in, in this place or this process. Because many people feel um, out there that they're, they, they're the only ones experiencing these feelings and there can be a lot of shame attached to it. A lot of loneliness because of that. I and mean, then when you when when you realize you're not alone, it's a big part of it. And then secondly, connecting to a like-minded community, which is a lot easier nowadays with online communities like, like with what we're sharing now. And finding a good therapist, um, healer, practitioner, shamanic practitioner, whoever, who first of all is acting from a place of having done their own work. That's the biggest criteria for working with any therapist or a practitioner that they've done the, the work themselves to I mean down that road and they're open to the fact that they're wounded because many people are going around thinking to get a qualification in this or study that or come out of university and, and that they, they can be there for the people. The way of the wounded healer is, is, is the only way that interests me in, in regards um, anybody that I would work with or recommend others work with that they're realizing that they're in the same boat but they may be a little bit further down the river because they've already done the work on themselves and then again and again as you say starting out on this process you know be being honest with yourself look at where your addictions are look at where you know you're avoiding things look at how you're trying to numb things out like initially it will be scary be a little bit daunting but you know once you get over the first hump like you did when you went into that um, group and you spoke out you come out and you realize, you know, you've unburdened yourself. You've, um, you know, connected to other people and that it's okay. And that your psyche is constantly trying to help you heal anyway. That's why the journal would, and dreams particularly yeah. would show you exactly what's going on within yourself. So that's what I would suggest, you know, for people starting out from the journey. Start. That's the main thing. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Take the first step. yeah. <clears throat> I, think, um, I think that's great advice as well because, but like even... So I say a couple of people I know, like one of my friends, he he kind of knows he has like a lot of healing to do and he's very aware of like what it is and what he needs to do. But I suppose there's fear. He's afraid to actually start because he's afraid to face his pain. And I do you think there's a lot of people out there that are very aware, maybe or like maybe not even very aware, but just partly aware that they have a lot of stuff that they need to deal with or addictions and stuff, but they just don't want to face that because of the fear 
of the like pain they'll have to go through and in your opinion do you think like is this a path that everyone should take or well, maybe not should is but is this the path for everyone or are some people just maybe not meant to go down this kind of path I think this path is for everybody in the sense, why are we here? Why are we incarnate in this physical realm, in this 3D reality? If it's not to grow in consciousness, to expand our awareness, to raise our vibrational frequency to higher levels of consciousness. Now, what stands in the way of that is, you could say, our trauma, our unexperienced experiences, the stuff we, we picked up from our parents, ancestral stuff, past life stuff. So that's weighing us down, coagulating in the psyche, um, leaking into our everyday consciousness, depression, anxiety, or whatever. So everybody's on this journey, whether they know it or not, or whether they want to know it or that. And what I find is um, for most people, it, they won't do anything about it until they're forced into it. Because the soul will constantly trying to bring us into place and positions and life will come at us in ways to prod us and poke us in the wounded places so that we begin that healing journey. Because that's why we're here. Now, you know, people resist that for good reason because it, they don't call it the road less travel for, for no reason it's like it's it's it can be a difficult path you know you're dealing with your own your own issues but after a while on the journey you realize that it's the best thing you can be doing because you start to feel more alive you start to um you know deal with behaviors like addictions that are you know bringing you down the wrong road and destroying your life and relationships and everything else you begin to feel more connected to a spiritual source because as you unburden yourself from the issues, emotional, psychological issues within yourself, you leave more room then to explore um, the upper world of the spiritual realm. So you, you're more connected to nature. You, you know, have a more heartfelt connection to other people in community. And then you open up to the idea that you're part of a cosmic consciousness that is expressing itself through you and so the more you raise your frequency by dealing with your issues and actual fact the alchemical engagement room gives you the energy to go into these higher dimensional realms then what happens is this, the ego and the self start collaborating cooperating with each other to the sense that your ego mind wants to take you on a work into a workshop it wants to get you to lie down and do a shamanic journey or a breathwork session because it's saying i like this i like this new me i like I like, to, I like to have this realization that I know that I'm more than my physical body. There's more to me than my problems and my issues. And I see that here in, in the Dairy Park all the time when people go through these process of healing. And like, you know, they will say, you know, was the, be the best thing happened to me was what caused me the trauma or the pain or the suffering because it awoke me to a new self, to a new realization. And if that hadn't happened to me, I'd be stuck in living this mundane, boring life where I'm, all I'm doing is just watching television, on social media, eating wrong food, um, just existing. But there's because there's life and a charge when you're on the journey, you know, when you're taking that role, role of the inner healer um, and, and on that path, you become much more enlivened over time and you, you realize that you're more than what you thought you were before. And then it becomes an adventure of self-discovery and you want to keep at it because you, you get to love it. Yeah, the and again, like I think I said at the start, the process of the whole thing, because only recently, obviously, when you feel great, everybody loves that. So it's great when you're in those when your vibration is very high and you're you're feeling fantastic with life. But obviously, like everything that will come down and you'll be in the shit then. And only recently I'm I'm able to. I'm starting to just grasp being able to observe it and be grateful and embrace the, the, the negative feelings because it's like for the first time, I, I just know they're going to pass. I know I'm going to learn something from it. It does not get rid of the feelings. It, still feel, it can still feel horrendous, but it's just knowing it's like, this will pass. I'm not sure when, but I'm just going to sit in it I'm going to keep breathing. I'm going to keep journaling. Like you said, that's for me now is massive and just knowing it's going to pass. And, and when I'm, when I'm up as well, like knowing that I ain't going to stay up there, you know? So like Cormac said before in a workshop, life is, it's like a heart rate monitor. It's up and down. Like if it was level the whole time, that's, that's signals death, doesn't it? <laughs> Absolutely. And, and you're so right. 
it's about finding meaning in our suffering in the sense that um, you, you can bear it better when you know it has a purpose. It's not that your suffering goes away. We need it. To be incarnate in this reality is to suffer. I mean, that's, that's the growing pains of soul, as I talk about. When you find meaning in it, I find people can then bear it better because they can say, okay, so this is my individuation process. It's been driven by my engagement with my hurt, my pain, my trauma, my woundedness. And that is exactly what's stressing me and waking me up to new realms and new realities. So therefore, it's okay. I, 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 can, I, can, I can bear it now. It doesn't mean there's anything wrong with me. I don't need to blame myself. Because what I find what a lot of people suffer from is what I call secondary suffering. It's like they are ashamed of the fact that they're suffering. They are embarrassed by the fact that they're not okay and that there's something going on for them. And they are you know, blaming themselves, thinking less of themselves because they have a depression or they have an anxiety or there's something going on for them. And that secondary suffering is even worse in some senses than the original trauma, the original, the original pain, the soul pain that's in you, it's there to wake you up. And when you engage with it directly, you get relief, you get understanding, you get more consciousness. But with the secondary suffering, which is what's going around in people's heads all the time, the monkey mind, well, you're not good enough, you know, you should be ashamed of yourself, you know, you should be embarrassed. This is this is family stuff that you have to keep hidden and keep sick, keep secret. The judgmental stuff, the stuff that kind of mindfulness helps us kind of sort out a little bit. But that secondary suffering, it often is blocking people from directly engaging with the 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 source of their, their trouble. That's why experiential work, the like breath work, and shamanic journey and works and psychedelics work because they open up the coax, the deep um, thing, and, the, and it brings it to the surface, cathars and moves it through. But what we need to train ourselves to is not allow the monkey mind to take that over and turn it into something that we turn against ourselves. Yeah, that's, that's a brilliant point as well. I had a, a moment of realization myself recently at a men's circle um, run by a fellow down the road here, and, and he was... He was doing a bit of one on one shadow work with me and he was trying to get to a root of a it was like something I wasn't integrity in integrity with. So I didn't keep a promise to myself. And he was like, that must be, be because of a root belief that you have about yourself. And we worked down to the, see what the root belief was. And then it was that I still felt I wasn't good enough. And I was like, for fuck's sake, when he said that, I was like, for fuck's sake, I've been doing how much this work on myself to try and love myself. And that's what I talk about in schools, to young people, like, you know, you don't have to achieve anything. You're like worthy of love as you are. And I was kind of like, as you said, the secondary suffering, like giving out to myself for still having this feeling. And he just goes, as long as you're breathing, you're still going to feel that somewhat. Mm -hmm. It's like, it might be less intense than it was years ago, but like some part of you. And I, I think maybe it's because like, as I said to someone recently, it's like, because we are human, we're flawed. So we always think that we're not good enough because we know what we could be, I suppose. So, but once he said that, it just, I felt like a release. It was like, okay, I just, I don't have to get rid of it fully as if it's like, you know, I have to be perfect. I, it's okay to have this little feeling of, well, maybe I'm not doing enough. And maybe that's what drives, drives us to do things and help people. And yeah. As long as it doesn't control our lives, I suppose that it's it's okay to have it. So I think me for me, it's like just accepting the imperfections is a big lesson for me because I think I was nearly caught up in the the healing and the becoming better, which is important. But I was, you know, when are you going to feel joy for who you are if you're always trying to be better and you're always like oh, I'm still not there? And as actually one of our a fellow Nathan who works with us, he said. Uh, in a video he put up recently that like we'll always be unfinished you're never going to be there so just i think for me it's like learning to just accept myself as i am and enjoy that journey when i need to do the healing when i come up against a block then i go into it i don't go looking for the healing yeah you're right you're absolutely right it's about observing our minds and keeping a check in on the monkey mind and having a dialogue with it and and having an extra collaboration with it and that's why this detached awareness where we watch ourselves, we observe how we get triggered and how the narrative sets off in our minds, how we turn that narrative into behavior, then that behavior creates more issues coming at us. And then we have a whole drama going on that many people are unconscious of. Well, if you just simply stop for a moment and say, oh, look at my drama now. 
Isn't that interesting what I'm doing here? And you're, you're like, you're watching yourself like you're in some sort of Shakespearean play. You see how you're moving around and then you see how you've invited others into play their part for you. And the drama is ongoing and continuous. And I think the key to it is, is to observe what's going on at that level within our minds. And then the mindfulness practice of, of merely observing it, it's not trying to change and not detach it because you're, you're right in what you say. It's always going to be there at, at, at different levels. But when you observe it and you work with it and you don't get attached to it, you can then um, be in the world, but not of it. You have a separate reality that you can exist within and then observe yourself interacting with the 3D reality. But there's a, you're, you're, you've connected now to your higher self, to the place beyond um, the physical body, the place that is connected to, um, to the cosmic consciousness, that is connected to the archetypal realms. And this overviewer can say, well, there you are now, John, Mary or, or, or Margaret, you're in the world, you're playing out this game. It's a karmic play. Maya, the illusion is, 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 is all around you. And you can say, well, the purpose of all of this is for me to learn. For me to learn to wake up from this place, to realize that this is an illusion. It's a 3D kind of holographic universe that I'm in. And the mind can be, you know, my enemy or my, 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 my friend in terms of how I engage with it, how I dialogue with those, those kind of thoughts and experience. And then I don't allow them to become narratives that become the scripts that I write for myself that I act out of. And this is, this is how I, who I think I am. Like many of the people are going around looking for validation for themselves in the world um, because they're wounded somewhere within themselves and they're giving themselves away. Whereas they were just turning around and, 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 and contact that little heart inner boy of that heart little inner girl, that soul part and hold it and cuddle it and allow it to cry, allow it to express itself you know, without shame or judgment or whatever, then, you know, you come back home to yourself and there's less reason why you have to go around the world in social media or whatever, looking for likes, looking for this, looking for follows, looking for whatever, in order to validate who you are within yourself because you already validate yourself. Because you know you're something more than what you've been told. And you only know that when you trans, when you, when you check, you know, you connect to the transpersonal dimension of who you are. And you only do that by practice, what I call the meds. Instead of taking medicines, I call the meds. Meditation, exercise, diet, and spiritual practice. Mm. You know, if you follow those as something that you do in your everyday life, meditation can mean anything from journeying to dream work, exercise, very important, keep the physical body, you know, at a high vibration. Diet, people are eating the wrong foods a lot of time, which is actually food and mood is something that we talk about. And then spiritual practice can be whatever you're into yourself. Like there's no particular right or wrong way to do that. So the meds is, is the method that I use for myself and other people have found that idea useful too. That's what I really like about the transpersonal approach. There's no, as you said, your spiritual practice, whatever that is to you. And I think that's important for me as well, like because with religion or whatever, we seem to have become so judgmental of others who have different beliefs to us and people think you're wrong if you believe this whereas with the transpersonal stuff as you say you don't need any particular beliefs to go into this work and like a lot of people come to you as the last resort because they've been to the yeah. psychotherapist or psychologist or the through the medical system and you know there's they're telling them there's something wrong with them and they they don't know what where else to go when they come to you and things start to make sense and even in my own journey like I was all about the mind as the most logical person you could come across, like working in IT. Um, and then, but like the mindset stuff just only brought me so far and there was something missing. And then when I kind of went into this realm, the more, I suppose, spiritual realm, everything started to make sense. And I started to see that I am more than just my physical body and personality. And I think, as you said, if we can, you kind of need to experience that really to, to understand it, whereas I suppose religion kind of tells you just to believe. I think for people nowadays, they want to have an experience of things. So um, it kind of brings me into the next question. Like if say we want to give this, like we obviously we work with young people and like they're experiencing a lot of these problems, mental health problems. So like if you want to give them an experience that they're more than themselves, because you know, the t CBT stuff and all that can only get you so far, but like how, how would you see 
introducing younger generations from like maybe 17, 18 into this kind of way of thinking. Yeah, I like what you said there about, and this is why I love shamanism, because shamanism is spiritual democracy. It's the path of direct revelation. If you want to know something, you drop into your own imaginal realms, into whatever you want to call the spirit world, the other world, the imagination, the dream time, and you make contact with deeper forces within yourself and beyond, whether it's a power animal or a spirit guide. And there's no right or wrong way to do it. You listen to the four to seven beats per second of the drumming, boom, 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 which entrains the brain to move down into the theta brain with state, which opens the mind's eye into the world of the imagination. And, and, and therefore you have access to knowledge, wisdom and healing beyond the cognitive ego mind. And I'm constantly surprised people who come to see me who've never had any spiritual sense of anything or no idea to say, I don't know what shamanism is about. I haven't, I, I, I haven't um, ever read anything about it. And so I take them on a journey with the drum and they come back from the journey and, and they're often mind blown because they have discovered something within themselves that was there and was latent, but they had never given themselves permission to experience it or never been given a method on how to. And the shamanic journey is a very simple, straightforward method and means of working with dreams or working with guides or your deeper self, whoever. So in terms of working with younger people, um, I've done shamanic journey with children as well as adolescents and, 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 and young folk. And I would, I would suggest that that would be a way in for people, like without kind of over -dra dramatizing, oh, this is shamanism and you have to have this way of thinking. I would say very little about what shamanism is, about, is actually about. I would introduce it as, as an idea to younger people. And they say, oh, we're going to do a kind of a meditation with the drum. And, and you explain a bit why the drum helps them move into a deeper uh, meditative state. And then you say to them, you know, you're going to go to a beautiful place in nature with, with this vibrant and alive and, and going to meet with an animal there that you have a telepathic connection with. And then it might bring you to a spirit guide and then ask those guides what you need and, how, and ask them for help. And you may find you get a physical energy movement for you. You may have a, a direct telepathic communication or you have a feeling about something. But the idea is you're going to touch into wisdom and information that is beyond your everyday cognitive mind, your ego mind, and see how that goes. And I never put a trip on people about getting it right or get it wrong. I say, whatever happens is meant to happen and is part of the journey and the experience. So I, I know other people I've that have trained with me have taken the shamanic journey into in groups of young people and have had quite significant success with it in, in, in those places. Mm -hmm. So that might be a suggestion you might want to take up. Mm, definitely. Mm. Just while, while we're on that there, what would your views be on the current education system in Ireland? I, I don't have a lot of um, faith in the education system in, in Ireland at this time, or ever, for that matter, because, I mean, to be honest with you, um, I see a lot, of, a lot of people, I mean, like myself, when I was at school, I spent most of the time looking out the window, not paying attention. I, I mean, you could probably have diagnosed me as ADD or ADHD if, if it was today, but it wasn't. It was my imagination. I was bored with this, you know, system that never taught me very much that had any real, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm 65 years of age now and I look back on my life and what I do today, very little of it was any use to me. I like it, naturally I learned to read and write and stuff with that, but history and all I'm reading, I'm reading back now and realizing much of what I was taught at school wasn't real, wasn't true. And my sense is that the educational system is to conform and make compliant children to adapt to a society that is about, you know, your materialism and about profit and to turn them into good little workers so that they will serve that system um, for the people who run the show. And, you know, I see it getting worse and worse all the time. There are friends of mine now who have young children won't send them to regular schools. They're sending them to forest schools or alternative schools, diner schools, because um, the educational system um, is, uh, used to condition young minds in order to comply to a system that is sick. As I often say to some people, I say, you have to be a little bit crazy to stop yourself going mad in an insane world. We're living in an insane world, and with the, particularly with the Batico mind virus is causing egophrenia, and people just get more and more um, into themselves, more selfish and, and, and greedy. And this often is what is taught at school, not about 
loving your, 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 your fellow humans, protecting the environment, you know, looking after animals, useful thing. I'm sure there are some individual teachers, some of the individual schools are doing that. I'm heartened by the fact that you guys are being invited into schools to do the work you do there. But, um, you know, in general, I, I would question why we're teaching our kids what we're teaching. And is it really preparing them for what life is actually really all about? Yeah, I totally agree. Mm. And I think, as you said there, like there is some, like we've come across, like we've been into many schools around the country and we've come across some really good teachers, like some, and maybe some that are not as passionate about their jobs, but it's the system that is the problem. Like it's not necessarily the teachers themselves. It's it's just the, the whole system is focused on, as you said, like cooperation, like with rules. Um, it's, it's not about collaboration with people. Like, you know, we're learning a lot, even at the weekend there, we learned about the importance of community and how we all work together through this drumming session we were doing. He was like, some people need to play this beat. Some need, people need, need to play this. Well, everyone's holding the space. Other people can go and listen and enjoy the music. And it's just about the kind of, how we all need to be part of it and work on our own area and in school like you're not you're not encouraged to sh even show anyone your work or like come up with ideas it's again maybe in little parts there is but in general that system is i think it's just very outdated and it, what we are thinking i suppose in the future is helping young people kind of bring them together as you said reconnecting them back to nature and the importance of like their connection with nature and the environment and like we, we actually did some some work with like sixth class students there in the local school there and like 12 year 12 year olds and they're like they love all this stuff they're so open to it and it's like as they get older we just like as you said like you just get bored and we're like draining that imagination out of them because we say stop looking out the window don't be daydreaming and it's like that's what we need is the ideas from these young people and i suppose we see our job with Wolf Academy is half of it maybe is teaching things like tools, but the other half is just allowing them space to grow naturally into who they want to be. Um, and actually on that, I think myself and yourself had talked about this during the week that what we're missing as well in for young people today is that role of the elder or like the, they don't really have anyone to go to say when they are struggling like that kind of wise elder that has been there before um so do you think there needs to be a reintroduction of that or maybe how would you see that working in yeah i see i see that i mean you know i'm of a generation a boomer generation born 1956 i had strong connections with my grandfather the, the healing father uh, grandfather and, and and learned a lot of things from him and that was a very important role in my life and my own father as well in, in, in some senses. Um, but what I see today is to see young men in particular don't seem to have connections to the father or the grandfather or to the positive masculine. And it's like, in some ways, our culture or society is demasculining, you know, they're demasculining young men. It's like, you know, when you hear about the testosterone levels, you know, dropping in, in men, when you hear about the metrosexual man when you hear about you know having to be a certain way and and, and relationships and, and 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 of course having to be sensitive to naturally and rightfully so to women and women's rights and women's and women's issues um that's all very important and and then i hear from the women that that i am working with the, you know saying often you know what's wrong with men i mean they seem to have lost their um, energy they've lost their balls they've lost their their their, their sense of being you know, the, the, the strong male. And um, while in groups, women might be saying one thing, but personally, they're saying other things that 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 young men, you know, have disconnected or lost their warrior spirit, their, their, their power and their strength. And um, I have to say, and, and I question this, is this a deliberate policy mm -hmm. from the powers that be to emasculate men so that they can control and run our, our society, you know, much more so because you take, they take the strong male protective figure out of that um, scene and, you know, uh, feminize them, turn them into, you know, less masculine beings. Is, is that something that, you know, is, is part of a policy to 
you know, make us more compliant or whatever. But what's, what's what I find interesting is that, you know, the young women are saying that men are losing their masculinity. And while on the surface, women may sometimes think that that's why it should be intuitively and, in, and instinctively within themselves, they're looking for something different. Because we must look at the idea of, from Jung's point of view, the anima and the animus. The masculine, men are, have a masculine, as a feminine soul, the anima. Women have a masculine soul, the inner contrasexual. So what you are on the outside, you have the opposite within your unconscious. So men certainly need to be in touch with the feminine side, the softer and more nurturing side of things. And women need to be more in touch with their masculine side, which is willpower to get things done and make things happen for themselves in the world. But we also need to, you know, be what we are at, 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 the, at the conscious ego level. If I'm a man, I'm a man, you know. And then we have the whole um, idea of um, gender and, and the way gender issues have emerged in, in our culture. And like people ask me, what's your thoughts on that? And I say, well, the soul doesn't have gender. We, we, we may take on a physical form in this lifetime that is masculine or feminine or transsexual or lesbian or gay. And that's OK, because that's just a soul coming in here to have an experience through that prism, through that lens of being transsexual or gay or, or lesbian. And that's just, just not perfectly fine. But also, if we come in to be heterosexual, then it's OK to be heterosexual too, just as it's OK to be gay, because that soul is experiencing itself as heterosexual. And then if we come in to be a man, we might want to experience the different range or gamut of experience of being the macho heterosexual man right around to being a gay man. That, you know, the level of um, experience on, 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 the, on, on the, the, the scale is, is up to the individual to pursue. But I don't think we can have one size fits all. I think we're all individual souls here expressing ourselves in, in, in different ways. And we all need to be accepted for that. We all need to be held in, or in whatever position that we are come here to experience. And we certainly shouldn't be in a, in a society that dictates the norms or, or, or what is normative for the individual soul to experience. So that, that whole idea of young men, you know, and, I, and I'm delighted to see young men like you in Wolf Academy and other young men I know who are coming together um, to create circles, going out into the woods and, and having fire ceremonies, drumming ceremonies, doing shamanic rituals with each other and helping each other because it's like you have to, because there, there are very few male, older male mentors or, or elders now anymore to act as an example because they have lost their way too in many cases. So what is happening now is young men are initiating themselves amongst themselves. I still think somehow it, 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 that there, there, there are important roles for older men to play mm. with younger men nowadays. Cause I mean, older men like me, we, we, we've come through different times different social mores and had different experiences. And I think, you know, having an exchange like this is a wonderful way of, you know, talking about these issues between the generations. Yeah, I think there's so much to learn. Like, as you said, just even if it's not like from like, say someone who has had a spiritual path, but like someone who is in an older generation who's been through those tough times and like has worked hard and, you know, raise the family and struggle to survive. Like there's so much we can learn from them and even realize our own privileged situation that we're in at the moment. So I think definitely for me anyway, it's something, I suppose it's a relationship I haven't really had with my own father or grandfather. It just hasn't been that kind of like passing down of knowledge, but like, I think it is important for us to reconnect with the older generations who have been through so much and like, for guidance and you know advice on maybe how we should go about our lives as well and we don't have to take everything on board but like it's just to hear that wisdom i think will be huge because as you said like young people are initiating themselves and in some cases it's okay if you have like maybe like say if the work we're doing in the, in the woods like bringing men together we're all kind of just sharing our you know what's keeping us down and help and support each other but if you go back to like people in school they're looking to their peers for how to be a man but they're like 16 year old doesn't know how to treat a woman properly or like how to actually be a man because they're all looking to each other and they're just i suppose lost but 
that if we bring back that role of someone that's been a bit further down the, the river to look at and kind of model, I suppose that's something that we, we know that is very important. So it is something we're looking to bring in and possibly work with others who are like the likes of Dear Middling or Michael Ryan and even Pat Dively as well. Maybe he, I think he might be doing something along those lines. So I think it's men coming together to try and figure this out for the younger generations is very important. Absolutely. I mean, as you know, I said, maybe, you know, you can Google information, but you can't Google knowledge and all the people, you know, they may not be as hip, they may not be as cool in social media, they may not know things that, that you know, the Google generation can, can just look up. But life experience is something that you can't Google and you can't, um, you know, read in a book. It's like, you know, going through the struggles of, say, growing up in the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, and just sitting down with, with all the people and listening to how they coped, how they managed, what they knew, what they learned. There's nuggets of wisdom in there. As you're right, you say, you don't have to take it all on board because they're kind of stuck in past um, memes as well that don't fit the modern generation. But there are nuggets of wisdom in there. And, you know, this idea, you know, the, the older men's men's sheds, it's like, you know, I, 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 would, I would have a vision of younger men connecting with older men's sheds, maybe inviting these men in to teach carpentry to the younger men or teach you know, skills that maybe are getting lost nowadays, or just again, telling their story. I, I love listening to old people, really mm -hmm. old person. My mother's 90. And to listen to her about the stories of growing up in the 30s and 40s, 50s. And I love my grandparents' old, old stories as well, how life was back in the day. Um, and it's so rich. And, 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 and it's, it's, you know, it's been part of our culture for a long time, like the older generation sitting around, talking to the younger generation, dialogue, discussing things. Um, and we're beginning to lose that. And I think it would be a shame. I think we'd be less, you know, human in our, in, in our lives and in, in our families and in our culture if we're just relying on, you know, what we get on social media and from, from our peers. Because it's, and then, of course, the generations coming after us, like the generations coming after you guys, you know, in the, in the teens, like you're bringing that knowledge and information from the older people to yourselves and then bringing your knowledge back to the younger generation. So I think you're right. Yeah, that's really important. One thing I was I wanted to kind of move into is like our relationship with the land and nature and how like we've become so disconnected from nature and the land that we live on. And why do you think that separation seems to be at the moment? And I suppose one example is Currently, what's going on here in right beside, I'm living right beside the Boyne River, and there's a Don Meats factory looking to build a, a water waste pipeline into the river. And a lot of local people are, are objecting to it, obviously, because of, you know, the water treatment isn't going to be up to the standard it's needed for drinking water. And the Boyne River is such an important um, part of, I suppose, Irish society. And it always has been. And if we treat the water like this for profit, it's for profit, really. So they don't have to bring the waste down to Dublin. Um, so we're putting the profit before the land that we live on and that we need. So why do you think that separation is there? How do people not see the importance of treating the land with the respect it needs? Yeah, I think when we lost our shamanic connections to um, the realization that Mother Earth Gaia is a living organism, and she's a living being that when we go out and sit with trees, we're talking to a sentient being, we're talking to the pulse of the earth, we're talking to the animals, the water, the elements, that these are living experiences. These are actual spiritual um, connections that we have and that there is a voice in nature that when you tune into the shamanic rhythm and the shamanic sensibility, you can hear that voice and she will speak to you. She will advise you, she will counsel you. But because of the way our culture and our society has become so materialistic and so um, driven to one, being one-sided um, that we lose connection to that. So therefore we, we rip the earth for her assets. We see her as, and it's the way we treat the feminine in general. And it's been the, 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 the disregarding of the feminine principle in ourselves and in nature um, that we see it as a commodity to be used. And particularly because we, 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 we've lost the spiritual connection that the indigenous people still have that our ancestors very much had, and that we just, you know, dump water in it, and, and, and so much so. And it's, 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 it's probably something to do with that there's a massive collective soul loss in humanity. Mm -hmm. 
And that emptiness that's inside of us, we seek to fill from the outside in with new cars, foreign holidays, in money, you know, sex, drugs, rock and roll. So we, 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 because we don't deal with the issues by becoming the wounded healers, we rape the earth in order to stuff all that stuff down into that emptiness that we feel so that we think that that's going to solve the problem and it doesn't. And we end up actually threatening ourselves as a species that may not survive on this planet if we continue what we're doing. I had a journey one time where I met Gaia, the spirit of the earth, and she said to me, I'm leaving here, she says. I'm going to leave it to the vultures to pick on its bones and, and then I will return. And I said, you can't do that. And she says, you're coming with me. And I says, no, I work to do here. She says, your work is done. And what she meant was that the earth will survive as it has for billions of years. But if we continue as we are as a species, raping our resources, she's going to withdraw. She's going to pull back. She's going to create droughts and famines and all sort of we'll create them ourselves. And then we would be in danger then of not even existing as a species, which would be a tragedy in some ways, but in other ways, Mother Earth would say, yeah, that was an interesting experiment. Good luck. Let's next see, can we get a species now that actually, you know, work with me to in harmony with, with, with what nature is really all about. Yeah. yeah. I just I'd touch on what you said there about how we are raping the land of its resources to fill some sort of void. I last year spent, I felt very called to go and spend three days, three nights in the forest um, by myself with, with no distractions. Just, I didn't know what the reason was for it, but I just knew I wanted to do it. And on the last night, what really profoundly came through for me and I, I do feel was the, the reason I was being called there was a message which was saying, or I was saying it to myself, reconnect with nature, reconnect with yourself, reconnect with others. And what I took from that was that by reconnecting with nature first, everything else will follow. So if we are destroying it to, to fill a void, it's literally that we should be doing the opposite to, to fill ourselves, Do you know, what what we're naturally supposed to do so it's like it's just such a it's just funny how we're doing like the, the exact opposite of what would actually help us absolutely and i mean i don't think that's just on an individual basis you know we talked about the educational system um, earlier. i think our society and our culture is deliberately doing this and it's set up to do that um you know the the the, the corporations the the ones who are in charge of of, of everything who have all the money and, and make profit out of you no know, exploitation of people and the earth herself. Um, it's like, you know, we'll be told, oh, recycle a few plastic bottles and you can do your part for saving the earth. You know, I mean, I mean, that's your and it's your fault that, you know, this planet is the way it is with climate change and everything. It's your fault. It's not our fault. It's not an individual. It's not an individual Johnny Smith down the road who forgot to recycle his Coca-Cola bottle last week. It's to do with the fact, as you say, Don meets over there in the bar, I'm going to pollute this river just because they, it'll be more profitable for them to do so. And more so, we have to ask the question, where are our political leaders to stop this? Where are, where's the Green Party or these people who pay lip service to protecting the environment? But come, when it comes right down to it, sell us and nature out to the highest bidder. Yeah, and that's the, I suppose it's smart in a way that they have a, well, I don't know how I wouldn't be too into like conspiracies necessarily, but I suppose the Green Party is there. So we all think, ah, the Green Party, they're going to protect the land, but they're not like, as you said, where the where the fuck are they? Like we're it's normal people that live here. We're going to be the ones down there standing in front of a bulldozer if it's about to build a pipeline. I'm like, if as someone said to me before, yeah, it's great. Help, like what we're doing, like helping the people. Yes, that's important. But if you don't help the land, then there's no point because there's no people. If there's no land, we'll be gone. And as you said, the land will live on. It's the people that won't. And that's the, the myth that we're all thinking. Uh, we don't really care about the land. It's like, well, do you care about yourself? Because like we're only killing ourselves. And it's like, it's us people who are going to be down there, everyday people standing to stop this. And like, you don't see the politicians around. Well, maybe there's a, there's a handful, but like the majority of them are just paying lip service. 
Um, and I suppose it's people say to me sometimes, oh, would you ever go into politics? And I always say, no, I actually want to do something. I don't want to just talk about something. Um, <laughs> and, and another thing you touched on there, I went to this fa- fella Ravi for massage there a few times and he was talking about, I think I asked him the question about like, oh, I feel sometimes, you know, this call to kind of go to countries like Africa and Asia where people are suffering and they don't have food or water to drink. And I was like, you know, I, I can't grasp that. Like, why shouldn't I be helping them? And he goes, well, is the problem poverty or greed? He's like, is there enough food in the world for everyone? And I was like, yeah. So he's like, what's the problem? Is it poverty or greed? And I was like, well, greed is the problem. And he says, so who do you need to help? And I was like, I suppose you have to wake up the greedy people. So he's like, yeah, so your work is here in Ireland. You know, so that was a big realization for me. It's like, as you said, like we can donate to Trocar or whatever. That makes us feel okay. We're doing enough, but it's the greed that we need to get rid of and trying to fill ourselves from the outside. That's the problem. And that's what's causing all the world's problems. It's not poverty. Like there's enough food for everyone and there's enough, like the earth will provide enough more than enough if we actually treat it with respect. So I think, um, that's, I suppose my realization is helping people wake up to that is important. Yeah, you're right. I mean, the old idea of think globally, act locally, you know, that the, our work is here is where, wherever we are. And I noticed, in the last 25 years, I've been running um, the shamanic center at Dundee Park that when people found a way into the shamanic way of being, shamanic way of working, they became naturally ecologically minded, even mm-hmm. so they may have not been before. But when they were out stalking awareness of nature, making contact with a living sentient being that was the tree, um, finding the power spot on the earth, mixing and communicating with the elements of air, fire, water, earth, that something came alive in them. There was within them all along. And they just naturally then felt that they wanted to help protect the earth because they had a personal relationship with her spirit. And that's something I think we need to be um, more and more uh, um, involved with is bringing people into the spiritual aspect of ecology, this, the shamanic sense of that everything is sent in and alive. And then out of that place, holding our community together through drumming and journeying or whatever we do, and then we become activists out of that deep connection because it's it's a hard connection to the earth. She speaks through us. And of course, we naturally want to protect our mother to nurture and care for us. Mm. Yeah. I think that's yeah, such a good place to come from for activism because even I think with everything you can be coming for, from it for the wrong reasons because even when I was younger, I was I set up Pizza Sunday Club with one of my mates, Martin Connolly, to help homeless people in Dublin um, or people experiencing homelessness, I should say. Um, and, but that was actually kind of partly coming from, yes, this is the right thing to do, but also avoiding my own suffering and blaming the government and looking, pointing fingers and saying, you know, the, you should be doing better instead of actually looking at myself. So I suppose, but once, suppose once I started looking at myself then and stopped blaming the world for being wrong, then I saw my own woundedness and how I was part of the problem and how I had to fix, well, not fix, but do the work to be able to actually come back then and actually help from the right place from like, as, as you said, this, this connection to the land for me has come out of no, like I've never felt that connected to it, but now it's like, mm-hmm. it's unquestioned that it's like, this is what we have to do because the land is part of who we are. Totally. I, 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 and, and it's interesting you say that, that you're coming around to that connection from, from the spiritual connection, which, which gives us a lot more empowerment then to, you know, really be involved. In, and you can see that movement's growing in, in this country. Like, I mean, I see more and more people who, you know, when they're out in active circuits, you'll, you'll see a shamanic drum somewhere amongst them. Some, and you'll see that bringing them together. And, you, you, you know, they'll, they'll journey to the, to the place. You see people up on Tara, Ushnok there at the weekend, um, you know, sleeping the Calia Cup outside Old Castle. And people will get out and walking on these sacred sites. And therefore, in doing so, they're connecting to the land. And, 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 and then they feel, yeah, I need to do something here. I, and, and it's because of out of a place of love and not anger that they often come. Mm. 
I suppose a lot of this stuff can sound like very heavy for people and um, even, you know, like very deep, I suppose, going into the, you know, your, your pain and different realms and stuff like that. But I suppose for me, one of the kind of realizations that I kind of keep continuing to have, I suppose it's a remembrance of sorts, is like the reason for this work is just to live with more joy and love in your life. And it's because even recently I was nearly getting st stuck in a loop of like looking at all my shadow stuff. And I just got so into focusing on that. I forgot about the whole reason I was doing it was like to live in the light more and to shine my light. And I, I just think it's maybe a nice way to kind of, um, as we come towards the end, just to kind of talk about the whole purpose of this shamanic stuff. Isn't just like, we're not going into the darkness for, um, to stay there. <laughs> yeah, to stay there. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. It's to, sh to shine light on them unconscious parts so we can actually enjoy our lives more and be better. And I think and maybe just actually to touch on, like to show our gifts to the world, because I had a realization recently that, you know, like, oh, what should I be doing, you know, with Wolf Academy or other things? And it's like, just follow your bliss, as you said, Martin, like, then like for we have these things that make bring us joy for a reason so it's like if we actually follow that maybe that's what we're meant to do here and the way it's worked out is that we actually enjoy what we do when and it makes a difference so i suppose um do you think people seem to be are like afraid to follow their gifts and why do you think that is well i think you're right i mean the the idea of shamanism is it is an archaic techniques of ecstasy mm. Shaman moves into ecstatic states in order to burn the shadow in the other game fuel to go into the ecstatic states, go from the personal to the transparent. So you're absolutely right. It's about going to shadow, but it's not staying stuck there. It's using the fuel of shadow to burn brightly into the joy, ecstatic uh, experience of our transpersonal self in the cosmic game of reality. And so trance dancing, drumming, um, community, um, getting out hiking in nature, micro dosing on mushrooms and um, getting into places where you um, are feeling joy and energy moving through your body because your diet's right, your exercise right, you're doing your spiritual practice. And you then find that you want to disengage from the material world. You switch off the television, you put your phone away, you stop um, going out to pubs and getting wasted on a Saturday night every week and feeling dreadful for the rest of the week because you want to wake up on a Sunday morning and hang out with your friends on Sleep in the Calyuk or out in nature or go hiking or whatever. And you, 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 it's a radical act these days to be ecstatic, to be joyful, and to put that as the center of your being. Because it's like it's our whole culture and society is designed in such a way to suppress the human spirit, to keep us down, keep us unconscious of our true nature, of our light beingness, of um, where we are going and how we are going to get there by raising a frequency. It's like there's a sense of uh, an agenda to keep people locked into being wage slaves, to have huge mortgages, have issues with kids going to school, um, you know, relationship difficulties, because when they're preoccupied with that, the difficulties of everyday life, they don't have a lot of time and left over to find joy or ecstasy in the dance of life and to realize their full, true, actual nature is life, is ecstatic, and is joyful. Um, and more often in order to, to, to find that, first have the burn, yeah, what we talked about, the shadow stuff, but then they have to separate from the norms of the culture that's trying to suppress them. And then they have to find their own truth within themselves, not anywhere else. There's a lot of spiritual gurus around these days. You see it, I see it on Instagram, and. Facebook promising, you follow my way, pay me this amount of money, buy this book, listen to my lectures and my talks that you're going to find Nirvana or the way to exit. I call bullshit on that. That's why I like shamanism, because it's the path of direct revelation. You want to know something, you go there yourself. Like, I mean, I sit in my space and I, I, I call myself a shamanic practitioner facilitator and facilitators to work. All I want to do is to facilitate the people to find their own power, joy, and, and, and individuation within themselves. And I want to help them. I just want to point over there. There's the signpost. 
I can't do this work for you. I don't know more than you do. I, in fact, I'm in the same boat as you are. But here's the thing. I've been down the road a bit. I found that this stuff works for me and I'd like to show you how it might work for you too, but I have no investment in any outcome for you. And I certainly don't want you coming back to me and saying, oh, you're amazing because you brought me into the world of spirit and showed me the way. No, I'm not. I'm struggling with you, but I, what gives me the most delight in life, what makes me happiest is when I see another soul wake up to the spark of divinity that is within them and to see them set off on the journey of self-discovery that, that I was fortunate enough to be guided on by others back in the day, like, like Carl Jung and Stan Groff and, and other people that I worked with. I love to see that. And I know, and I feel it the same from you guys in Wealth Academy, that that's why you're doing the work too. And I love to see that because not everybody out there is doing it for those reasons. And I caution people about these false gurus and sham shamans and you know, medicine circles, they're going to bring them and take their money and disempower them and not leave them in a good place. But I sense you guys are, 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 are authentic. And that's why, you know, I'm on this podcast with you, because otherwise I wouldn't bother. Um, and I love to see that. And I love to see young men like you and young women in women's circles coming up with the authentic, real, genuine love of the work, which is to help people wake up. And that is the reward for us in doing this work. Mm. Yeah, that was brilliantly put. Yeah, very good. Um, John, I so, yeah, I was so, just got a full stop after that. <laughs> um, yeah, I was just going to say maybe before we finish, do you want maybe if people were looking to get more involved with the work you're doing, or um, I know you have an upcoming um, festival next week, next weekend. Uh, maybe you just want to talk a bit about that. Yeah, the fourth and fifth of June, the June Bank Hall that we have the Spirit of Folk Festival which we run over the years and, and we've resurrected now for these times, um, which is a holistic folk festival. You know, it's very much about there'll be trance dancing, the shamanic journey, spirit boat at it, there um, music, of course, Kila and, you know, different kind of folk style bands and new upcoming bands. And then I'm just hanging out in, in the 25 acres of Parkland at Dundee Park with like-minded people. Um, it's a small festival. We don't have alcohol at it or, you know, that kind of thing. We, we try and keep it earth based and you know we're looking forward to people joining us there and then we're opening up to the shamanic practitioners course mm -hmm. again outdoors in the tent and then later on in the year as i said before we'll have breath work holotropic breath work and for the shamanic training and transpersonal training going on so people can find us on the website um shamanismireland.com with different videos and recommendations there if they want to come in and have a look um we'd be happy to see them brilliant yeah and i can say from my own experience doing the online programs um that yeah i i really loved it and i'm looking forward to doing the in-person shamanic practitioner training with you this summer as well so um but th thanks very much for coming on the podcast martin it's been i think it, we've had you in our sights for a while from near the start so i think someone mentioned your name so um it's great to actually have you on and get your wisdom and i hope it resonates with people and they might maybe as you said, ignite that spark in them to start maybe just looking a bit deeper. So thanks very much. Delighted to be on. As I say, I really support your guys' work. I, I, I see the authenticity of it and uh, happy to be here with you. And thanks for having me on. Yeah, thanks very much, Martin. It's been a pleasure. Thank you.